Welcome to another great back and forth with Becker and Nora. We're going to cover lots today, including the leadoff topic and monetary policy, money printing. Does it actually make a difference? Does it actually cause inflation? We'll go through a couple of data. We'll have a bit of a battle on that. We're going to talk interest rates, Barbenheimer, and we'll get to the question of the week. But let's just lead right off here, Kevin. Does money printing actually cause inflation? I'm going to give you some data, then you can react to that. This is what I put together. It looks at U.S. data, but would be applicable yeah. to Canada as well. You have the effective... Fed funds rate, so think of the central bank rate. We think of monetary policy, money printing, you think central bank. So the green line, central bank rate in the U.S. Blue line is the actual headline inflation. You get that period after 08, rates went to about nothing. And yes. they sat there for a long period of time. They went up a little bit, 16, 17, and they dropped them yet again. So you had almost a decade plus of like monetary policy, zero rates, money printing, whatever you want to call it. But inflation didn't really go anywhere. Inflation no. was kind of range bound, kind of two, three percent or, or under two percent didn't really go anywhere until you had the pandemic. And then you saw inflation spike. So the question is, if you had a decade plus of this monetary stimulus without any real inflation, what changed in the last couple of years? Well, I, I guess the biggest factor is, and again, I mean, Money printing has always been sort of there to a point, but it was never as dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what you saw after 08, as, as we saw, there's been basically from 08 right through to 2020, there was no inflation. It traded in that one to 3% range they did, and they kept interest rates low because really, if you're in your target range, you don't really need to increase rates. Plus, yeah. if you've got it at that low, more and more people are borrowing because, well, I'm not paying anything. So that in turn can lead to problems down the road. But as we saw in 2020, I mean, they had started to raise those interest rates because you'd started seeing that from all that free money. Then mm -hmm. what happens is the pandemic comes, interest rates get dropped to zero, and they right throw money at everybody just to make sure that they don't have to worry about the economy going into a deep recession. Well, if you're going to give people free money and there's nothing they can do but spend it, eventually you're going to create inflation. Mm -hmm. And how do you got to mm -hmm. cure that inflation again? Well, what we have to do is we have to start raising those interest rates to try and take that money supply out. And that's been the, the biggest factor we've seen since the pandemic. But again, 08 straight through has basically been in that same scenario. As long as you keep really cheap rates, people continue to borrow money and they borrow money because it doesn't cost them anything. And of course, that yeah. printing is going to have a big effect going forward. So that yeah. that's sort of where we've been at it at the last little while. And now we're getting that sort of corrective phase. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the what change point, uh, I'd argue it's, it's clearly fiscal policy. And you hit a yep. the nail on the head there. You give people money. And in the U.S., you had CARES Act 1 and 2, which happened in 2020. Then you had CARES Act 3 in 2021. In Canada, you had multiple uh, government initiatives as well, hundreds yep. of billions of dollars. In the U.S., there's trillions of dollars. And you look around the world, there's the same idea. That's what mm -hmm. changed. If you go back to that 08 period, to that roughly 2020 period, it was the austerity period, right? Yes. Everyone was talking about, oh, Greece is going to go bank bankrupt. They got to tighten the ship. They got to spend less money. So the central banks had to keep rates incredibly low to keep the economy afloat because the governments were doing the opposite. The That's governments right. were tightening the purse strings generally. There's always exceptions, but it was a kind of an austerity phase. Then you had the exact opposite rates at rock bottom, plus all that government stimulus, monetary plus fiscal policy. You saw that combination led to very high inflation. And then, of course, you have to talk supply chains. This is all demand side, right? You're talking mm -hmm. giving people money. They're going to buying goods. They're increasing demand. When you shut everything down, well, you, you mess up the supply chain. So the ability to supply goods was also impacted. So what changed? You had issues with the supply side and they had all that fiscal policy. So not central bank money printing, but the fiscal policy. I think that was kind of the big item. Uh, and here we are back to, I'll, I'll pull that chart back up. You can see the, uh, the inflation's come right back down. Rates have still been hovering there in the 5% plus. This doesn't include Wednesday's hike should be even a little higher then. And inflation right back to that zone it was for the better part of you know a, a decade. We're right back into that level. Yeah, and that 08 sort of scenario tried to give you that something that's a little bit new is trying to buy your way out of all these scenarios. Yeah. So you just keep giving people enough money. It's that sort of scenario, right? If you throw enough money at it, the problem's going to go away. Well, the problem does go away for a short period of time, but at the end, you're going to have to pay the maker somewhere down the line. You just cannot keep doing that, increasing mm -hmm. your fiscal policy, because as they say, governments right now at times are fighting what the Fed and the central banks around the world are doing. As long as you keep giving people more money, you're going to have to keep raising rates higher and higher to slow that inflation scenario down. So it yeah. is something that we're going to have to watch over the next little while. But you're right. As we've seen in the last probably year, the corrective phase is coming in and we are seeing those sort of uh, abilities to, to correct going forward. Yeah.
Fun fact for you, Kevin. Did you know this back in the 70s and 80s when they were raising rates to sky high levels? There weren't big press conferences when it came to the interest rates. They would just raise rates and people would find out later. Not the case. In case you're living under a rock, we had all these headlines that came out on Wednesday saying, oh, what? You know what? The U.S. Central Bank, they raised rates yet again. They went up another 25 basis points. So clearly we're in a different world than we were back then. It's lots of attention paid to every single move and every single word the central bank says. And in this case, they're hiking rates and they did it again on uh, this past Wednesday, up another 25 basis points. I think the overnight rate there is now at five and a quarter. So they put mortgages yep. kind of in that six, seven zone, depending. It, it, I'll pull this chart back up. Inflation is already very low or in that zone we've seen for the past decade, yet they keep hiking rates. What's going on? Yeah, again, I mean, it's a, you're right. I mean, all of a sudden they become rock stars, the Jerome Powell's of the world. <laughs> and it, it's that Bruce Springsteen 57 channels and nothing on social media. They're all over the place. You didn't get this back in the 70s and 80s. But you're right. I mean, with the interest rates, the way they keep going, they've raised them and they've raised them again because all of a sudden you're getting more and more of what's known as sticky inflation. I mean, yeah. theoretically, the theory is you raise the rates, inflation goes away. But not all inflation's gone. I mean, they want to get it back to that one to three percent range, and they're looking basically at two percent being your inflation scenario. So, how do you do that? You raise rates to try and get it there. Now, if you're stuck at a certain point, as we've seen, the interest rate increases are slowing, and and as mm -hmm. they've said before, at least on the Fed, they're going to be data dependent. So, are we going to raise again? Well, if the data says yes, then we're going to raise. If not, then maybe we're finished. So, I think we're probably at the high end of the rate scenario right now, maybe a quarter point more, or something like that. But you're going to have to see that inflation, even though it's hovering around that sort of three, three and a half percent range now. I mean, I think they want it back at two before they do anything along those lines to say, OK, now we're going to have to stimulate the economony again to go sort of. Yeah. And part of me is wondering, why don't we just keep it at three? Is it that bad? There's yeah. lo lots of jobs out there. People are making money. We've seen the real wage growth actually kick in for the first time in a long time. And it's actually above the rate of inflation, or at least matching inflation now since inflation's come down. And two just seems so arbitrary, right? Is there ever any magic yeah. number? Is there data <laughs> to say it has to be exactly 2% or the economy falls apart? Like, it seems like it's arbitrary. They just picked a number. One's probably too low. Three's probably too high. Two's, two's our target. Let's go with 2%. Uh, at least my opinion. Maybe there is lots of data I'm not aware of, but it, I'm not sure we need to be in 2%. Like, I think if we can no. keep the economy going with a relatively strong job market, that could actually be positive. I think people would accept, you know, a 3% inflation. No one wants nine, but I think three would be a tolerable number. Well, exactly. And I mean, of course, with all the rate raises, I mean, theoretically, you won't really find out how this is affecting the economy for maybe six months to a year down the road. I mean, you still mm -hmm. got people that have low mortgage rates that haven't had to renew yet. And, you know, if you're doing that a year down the road, how is that going to affect everything else? So, I mean, the rapid rise is great for a point that it starts to eliminate that inflation, but how bad will that effect be? We may not know till the middle of 2024. Yeah, and part of it thing, we've already seen inflation roll over and they kept saying, well, there's a lag, you raise rates, takes you know a year, maybe two years to see the full yeah. impact. Well, it's only been a year since they've started raising rates. Inflation's already rolled over, which tells me maybe there's more to that whole transitory supply side argument. Yes. And once the supply chains were fixed, you know, a lot of the inflation started disappearing and it wasn't so much to do with the actual rate, rate increases. Because you're right, we haven't seen the full impact and inflation's yeah. already moderating. So what does that impact kind of be? I mean, question. We don't know. We'll have to wait to see the answer. But one thing we don't have to wait to see the answer is apparently people like movies. <laughs> How's that for a segue? The Barbenheimer is full it. effect here, Kevin. You, I haven't seen either. Have you seen Barbie or Oppenheimer? No, I haven't had a chance. I was a Mission Impossible first, and now I'm waiting to get to this point. Yeah, and I pulled this up here. This is a, a kind of midweek come from boxofficemojo.com. Five day total. This is domestic. You can see they both did quite well. Oppenheimer, 100 yes. million plus domestic box office in five days. Barbie at 214 million. And then you look at the year to date. Again, this doesn't include this weekend. It goes to midweek, but year to date uh, worldwide. So not just domestic. I highlighted Barbie and Oppenheimer there. They're already racking in quite a bit. Uh, Barbie already at 472 million worldwide box office gross. Oppenheimer about half that. And you can see they're chasing the Super Mario Brothers. It kind of tells you two things. One is that obviously people are excited about these movies. Movies are yeah. still a thing. People are still going to theaters. And then two, if you look at this list, Kevin, we talked about this just a, a moment before we hit the record button. You got 15 of the top movies of the year by box office. And there's only a handful where you could argue they're actually original stories and not just remakes or they're not just 
you know, the sequels or Mission Impossible 7, John Wick 4, Fast and Furious 10. They're actually yeah. original stories. Yeah, and that's that's the big thing, right? I mean, we haven't seen that forever. I mean, basically what the studios have come out with, at least over the last few years, and especially during the pandemic, is, you know, a series that has done well, we know that if we produce another one in it, we're going to make some money somewhere down the line. And what you're starting to see also, though, with this sort of scenario is that these movies are making money, but they're not making the money they used to when you do yeah. it. I mean, Marvel's 14th or 23rd or 84th movie is only going to make so much more money than it did beforehand. Same sort of with the Fast X scenario or the John Wick thing. Yeah. You're finding that new movies, sort of that Barbie, that Super Mario, uh, the Eternal sort of things, they are all starting. It's a new storyline. People want to see it. And let's remember, it also depends on what your competition is going to be for there. I mean, most of the movies years ago, back in the 80s, you sort of made a ton of money because if you could stay in the theater long enough, you were going to get a lot of money and then you go to the, the, yeah. the video scenario that way. Nowadays, all your money is basically made in the first two weekends that you're open, unless you have no competition. I mean, Super Mario was that way. They had three weeks before a new film came out, so they dominated the box office in that scenario. Now, if something else new comes out, as we saw with Mission Impossible, wonderful first week, second week, Barbie and Oppenheimer come out, you can't find them anywhere. And that's yeah. probably going to be the way it is for the rest of the summer because now everybody's going to go see these other ones instead. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's good to see that. I like to see new storylines and everything else coming out. And of course, something that's a little more kid oriented, as Barbie is, will make more than something that's yeah, more Yeah, I was you don't mean Oppenheimer as a kid oriented movie. <laughs> no, definitely not. But yeah, so I mean, that, that's something that we got to work. But it is nice to see that the theaters are making money again because people do want to get out and they do want to mm. see some of these things. And again, some of the way they're shot, like, I mean, I know Christopher Nolan from Oppenheimer has done this in IMAX. So seeing it on that big screen gives you a little bit more than even the home theater can give you. And People are starting to go back for that, you know, the nice experience, the large seating, you know, everything else that's sort of at times the 4D effect that you can get out of some of these movies. Yeah, which is true, which is very true. Uh, we'll get to the question of the week here. And I think it's very relevant. We're talking rates just a moment ago. We had the rates yeah. rising. Now we're kind of seeing this moment where maybe we're getting close to a peak or at least very much slowing the increase of the rates. So this question becomes relevant yet again. If your mortgage comes for renewal, uh, are you sticking with a fix to go with a variable? <laughs> I, there's no one size fits all. We should start there. But what are your thoughts uh, on the topic here? Well, I, again, right? I mean, for, for basically the past decade, the, the winning tradition for this would have been going variable. We've had no inflation. We've had no interest rates. So if you're on a variable rate mortgage, you paid substantially less than what you would have had on a fix. And all yeah. of a sudden, I mean, if you were still on a variable a year and a half ago, you're paying hordes more now than you ever would have beforehand if you'd have fixed it. And th that's been the biggest problem, right? Because as the rates go up, variable mortgages move with it. Where we're at at this point in time, I mean, if you want cost certainty, the fixed mortgage is still the best way to go. You know what you're going to get for that next probably five years that you're locked in for. If you can make those payments, that's great. I mean, is the variable mortgage rate time to buy? Well, a year ago, no, but now maybe yes. I mean, maybe we get another quarter point. Maybe we're holding for a year. But if you're going for sort of a five-year term scenario, chances are that interest rates are going to come down over the next five years as opposed to continuing to go up. So your variable rate mortgage may come off a little bit. So again, yeah. it, it's it's a personal scenario to deal with, but rates are moving, right? Yeah, and it's the trade-off. There's always a trade-off. There's no perfect solution. The, the trade-off, the fix, you know what it is. You have some certainty. You can budget around it. Uh, and you're protected if rates keep rising. But if we're at a point where we think we're at a peak and in a few years we could even see the other side, well, the variable would benefit if you do, in fact, see that drop in rates. But there's no guarantee of that, right? Things could happen. There could be another reason rates could go up and you're taking a bit of risk. So you have to find what's the, the right fit for you. But we get those kind of questions all the time. And if you have a question of that nature or any other kind of question, please get a hold of us. You can go right there to the website on the screen, chatwithclintonkevin.com, fill in the form. We'd certainly love to hear from you. Any parting comments for the folks, Kevin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely done. We've taken enough of their time today. We will be back with another video soon. So you take care.